see And she floats, floats, floats With my problems Helps to take Take a little weight off me She's happy, oh, you know I'm in heaven And if she's sad, well She ain't gonna say it's Friday, March 18th. You're locked into Real Talk. Jesperson, Hoyles, and Hicks with you. We're going to be talking about uh, sports, international relations, and Russia today. Our Real Talk roundtable coming up. Uh, two pretty prominent Canadian media personalities. I'm certain they're not going to see eye to eye on much, which should make for an interesting conversation as we take a look at Canada's COVID policies, the conservative leadership race, Canada's involvement in Ukraine, And more with Sapria Devetti and Brian Lilly. That's coming up in about a half hour's time on this Friday edition of the show. And of course, Trash Talk coming up at the end. Uh, Technically, you've still got time to get a Trash Talk in if you want to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Although you'd be up against the wire. We do have them locked and loaded already, set to go. That's coming up in about an hour as we wrap up our broadcast week. In just a second, we'll debrief a a, a kind of a fiery ending to yesterday's show as, as we dug into... Matters of opinion on some pretty big picture stuff, some, some pretty important conversations. If you ask members of this team, people have different feelings on how that conversation went. And we want to talk it out right here with you, the audience that shows up with us every single day. Before we do that, I want to remind you that this show is presented by the team at Bitcoin. Well, it's a great time to remind you that our get real question of the week is up right now on our website, ryanjesperson.com. You go to connect and then click on question of the week. We want to know where you're at with cryptocurrency and nfts now they're not necessarily the same thing they don't have a a ton to do with each other or maybe they do if you talk about things like blockchain and digital investments and assets and well maybe you've got no time for this whatsoever maybe you are super keen we want to gauge the audience we want to see where you're at when it comes to cryptocurrency and nfts You can take our question of the week on the website right now. If you have questions about Bitcoin specifically and you want to go straight to an expert source, you want to talk to a real human being, we recommend Bitcoin. Well, you'll find them on the sponsors page right at the top on our website, ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. We'll talk sports, international relations in Russia coming up in, let's say, 10 minutes time or so. Uh, First, we wanted to address uh, the wrap up about the final 15, 17 minutes of yesterday's show. We've been talking about Kim Kardashian, of all things. I didn't think that Kim Kardashian or a conversation about one of the biggest celebrities on planet Earth was was going to trigger a pretty fiery debate uh, between our team. But it did. We started talking about how people get to where they are and privilege and voices and platforms and access to information and marginalized voices and equity and a whole bunch of stuff and we had this sort of talk radio moment where our team in particular me and our editorial producer Sarah Hoyles really got into it and it was a situation where I think both of us were uncomfortable at the time as we talked about it after and Sarah will share it in her words in just a second but after our show we went whoo And we all kind of took a deep breath and went, well, that doesn't happen every day. And my first inclination was that this was a huge success, that we had a great, fulsome conversation where neither of us really pulled any punches with regards to what we thought, but it didn't get personal. It didn't get nasty like oftentimes we see in society. You know, we have people asking questions all the time, real talk endeavors to answer these questions. Can people even have a conversation anymore? And we say, well, you can here. And yesterday, after we had a disagreement on the air, I thought that's what we talk about. That's us putting our money where our mouth is. Not everybody was impressed with the conversation. Uh, Some of you in varying degrees. We got notes from people, including sponsors of ours, that said that is what real talk is all about. And we got notes from other people that were basically telling me to go fuck myself. Uh, Not basically, actually, literally, Sarah Hoyles. And we take that kind of feedback seriously as well. And of course, this group, this team that puts this show together also is made up of individuals that have individual experiences. And so we wanted to circle back, I guess, about 22 hours later, Sarah, and and sort of say, you know, we've had some time to think about it. We had some time to, to digest. When we talked after the show yesterday, we were like, yeah, you know, it is what it is. It's talk. It gets heated. It is what it is. But 
you, know, you have time to think about it and sort it through and process it. And, and where are you at today? Yeah, I think after the show, I I was like, wow, that was intense. Um, but you know, you and I discussed it, and I felt, you know, there was a back and a forth, and and then I I went home and I rewatched it, and I was stunned actually. Uh, I maybe I'm used to it. Maybe I'm used to it in being in conversation with guys that I'm not necessarily. Uh, I don't usually have a camera on me mm. <laughs> when I'm having heating, heated conversations. Um, but I was able to like go back and watch and be, you know, a fly on the wall and just witness it. And it wasn't okay. Having heated, heated conversations, I'm all for. Going toe to toe, I am all for. Not agreeing, I am all for. But being steamrolled, um, having people try to explain what I was saying <laughs> back to me, being interrupted repeatedly, not being able to say a sentence without it being cut off, that's not okay. I'm okay with not agreeing, but I'm not okay with being steamrolled. Mm. We, we got a bunch of feedback from people talking about the dynamic of the conversation, in particular interruptions. Mm. And, uh, and, and you and I, and, and Johnny, I'm going to drag you into this, but the three of us were talking about different dynamics, for example, like around family dinner tables and things like that. And, I, and, and my expression at that time was, yeah, I grew up in a family where people pretty much competed for the conch to talk and everyone just talks over each other. And, and an interruption is, is like a, a sort of part of how people communicate. And what I realized over the past day, which I think has been a really valuable exercise, too, is number one, not just to understand it from your perspective. We had a great conversation yesterday afternoon. But also to understand uh, some of the bigger picture dynamic behind this, somebody reached out to us and said, you guys need to take a look at some of the studies that have been conducted, in particular about a gender dynamic when it comes to women being interrupted by men. And this is something part of a bigger picture conversation that I think is really important to have. And this is something that I've been doing a lot of thinking on over the last 22 hours or so. Right. I mean, I thought it was my personal experience and it, I, it was very lonely uh, and it's not that I'm like playing the victim because that I'm sure will get said. Oh, Sarah's playing the victim. Poor Sarah can't take the heat. Don't worry about what other people say. How do you f just worry about how you feel? Well, no, I. It's pretty loud. <laughs> uh, some people coming at me, and uh, what I realized is that I'm I'm not alone, and that this is systemic. And that's a big word. Uh, it happens to a lot of people and it's okay in a lot of circumstances, workplaces. This is a shared experience by many, many women. I can't speak for uh, marginalized group. I mean, I can't, I can't speak for black indigenous, you know, people of color. I can't speak for them. But I know that in my experience, so it was just very validating to wa watch it third person just witness it and sit and not have to think on my feet and not have to try to wedge my thoughts in whenever I got a, a spare moment um to just witness it and to see wow this is this it like this was textbook <laughs> this, mm. was, this was this was textbook for what it, women experience in the workplace and experience with um yeah, gender dynamics. Yeah. I mean, people can say that, oh, Sarah, you're making a big deal out of it. Just go back and watch. Um, I thought about not coming in today. Hmm. And I know that what that would do to the show. I know what, like, what message that could potentially send. But I was trepidatious about coming in today because do I want to subject myself to it again? Like, then it's shame on me if I want to do I want to subject myself and I, I don't want to be a pawn and I don't want to be fodder for people like this is I'm human um and that was a lot mm -hmm. well I'm glad you are here <clears throat> if I can say um it's a it's a different dynamic too isn't it like it, it the stakes are much higher when your workplace is a talk show right and when it's a talk show called real talk where we commit and we promise to take on subjects that create great degrees or great amounts of discomfort when we go there, right? And then when you stick your neck out, like you do or like I do, or yesterday, like I think that we did together, both taking a 
pretty definitive position on something and seeing what happens when those collide, right? Then all of a sudden, it's not like you're having an argument or a debate with somebody that's a private one, right? Or something where you're talking to somebody on the phone or in person or whatever. All of a sudden, you have thousands of people taking it in. And it creates, like you said, I mean, you're hearing from people. I mean, obviously, I've seen you're, you get a lot of support. But then also, you're saying that it's had a real impact on you. Uh, some people cracking on you and some people being tough on you. And it introduces, it, it becomes a whole different animal. It introduces a whole different dynamic when there's literally thousands of people that are taking in that exchange, you know? I mean, it just makes it that much more high profile. Absolutely. I think I'm here for the real talk, but real conversations also involve active, real listening. Mm -hmm. And it's not a lot of time, like in yesterday's exchange, watching it back, I, I wasn't being heard. I wasn't being listened to. And... So if we're if we're gonna engage in real talk, that means it's a two way street. Yeah, for sure. And this is real talk right here. And I'm glad that you're here having it. And I apologize that there was that you know that there wasn't uh, a point where I did adequate listening, you know. And I want to make a commitment to you to be a better listener. And uh, and I want to thank the audience, um, the people that were in touch with us. I mean, the the the, uh, the feedback truly has been across the spectrum, uh, and and in overwhelming amounts, uh, which is amazing. Uh, and it's great. It's a community that challenges one another and that holds our feet to the fire. And uh, we appreciate people that show up for these conversations. This is a learning experience. And um, I felt like, and uh, you know, I mean, you and I, obviously we have the majority of our conversations are off the air. Um, and so people have a tough time. I think of, of, of understanding maybe what our general dynamic is, our working relationship. Um, the last 15 minutes of yesterday, I think it's fair to say, is not does not characterize our working relationship. Um, and it was it was unfamiliar territory. When we were having the conversation, I was telling you yesterday, like when we were getting into it, I was like, my mouth was drying up. My hands, I felt like I hadn't eaten for two days. I was starting to get that. And you know, it's when your body's like, you're into one, like you're into one. And I was actually, it was it was exciting for me because I was like, this is really great content. This is great content conversation this is you are saying things and i am saying things that people want to scream from the rooftops but they don't have that platform to say it right and so i was thinking the content like what we're tackling and what we're talking about is so good and so important and then of course as the dust settles in the hours after and we start to evaluate more or have people point out to us or have people share their thoughts with us or you and i have a personal conversation about the more personal impacts of it, maybe not the message, but how the message was delivered or how the message was attempted to be delivered and not received or what have you. It's the dynamic around what happened as opposed to the subject matter of what we were talking about. Then that's a completely different conversation. That's what it is for me. Yeah. That I'm always ready to, to joust. I'm always ready. You know that off the air, on the air, I'm ready. But it's about being able to... Um, have the ability to finish sentences. And I, I don't feel that I was as concise as I would have liked to have been yesterday. I Neither of us ex saw that coming, though, either, right? You and I didn't, didn't write into the, to the rundown of the show. Uh, you know, we're going to talk about Kim Kardashian, and then let's just get into it for 17 minutes on some pretty meaningful subject matter about the importance of, I mean, we were, t we were talking about the importance of indigenous stories and cultural appropriate. I mean, it, it was all really, if you look at all of the things that we tackled in that 15 minutes, as part of, I thought, a relatively focused conversation, doesn't always feel like it in the moment. But those are still very important conversations to have. And, and what this has done, too, is serve as a reminder that different people communicate differently, you know? You all good? Just like I can take feedback and I can take constructive criticism, but to call out gender inequality and then to be said that I'm racist because oh, I'm discriminating against all white men with beards is ludicrous. And that just goes to show that people don't get it. They don't get what it means. I have privilege. 
you have privilege, different levels of privilege, different kinds of privilege. It's just, that's just. Obviously, I'm, I'm assuming you're reading it. I don't know what you're talking. Someone's just commented on that. I'm assuming. I don't know. Is that what? Yeah. Okay. And there, there were sentiments around that. Yeah. Um, yesterday, and it's just that is a misrepresentation of saying that there is an, a majority or a large portion of people that are in the media that are white and male. That is fact. <laughs> and to say that me talking about it and actually speaking it out loud makes me racist. But also, Sarah, like one of the most important things I've learned to do in my career, and yesterday was a good reminder too, is to take important points that people make, right? To, to seek out different perspectives. Everybody knows you do. You booked Sapria Devetti and Brian Lilly for the same round table today. Like that's, different perspectives you're not afraid of different perspectives and at the same time every once in a while you got to just forget about the comments it's not real life and in so many ways as a lot of people yesterday were telling me to fuck off and die people calling you a racist it's, it's the same ball of wax and that's the stuff like it's it's easier said than done i think for us to say just shake it off or just ignore the comments right if someone's calling you a racist but at the same time in real life you know where your heart's at. I know where your heart's at. I know what drives your passion. I've seen the editorial process. There's a reason why. I said this to people yesterday. There's a reason why you are hired to be the producer of this show. Like, I was not hired by someone and you were hired by someone and we were told to work together. That's not the situation, right? I hired you because of what you bring to the table, because of your skill set, and because the show is better because of your contribution. This is real life, man. This is real stuff. And it's not that I want to move on. I just, I also am like, we're doing a show. We have a guest. I like this conversation is not over for me. Um, it's, it's ongoing. And folks saying that, you know, they're, I saw messages yesterday that like I'm raising a, a white son and he's learning about women's rights and he's learning about equal rights. And what are you going to call him a racist if he has a beard? And no, the point is, is that we call it out. We name it. We bring it out into the light and we learn from it and we get better and we teach everyone the, the drawbacks and the, what's problematic about sexism and racism and misogyny and bigotry. Like that's why we call it out. Yeah. So we don't repeat and repeat and repeat. So well, it's not, and it's not like this show and your production efforts are all of a sudden going to start now to talk about these things. I always say to people like always say to people, just evaluate us on our track record. Like go through our go through our vault, go through our shows, go through our podcasts, see the conversations we've had. See the round tables we've hosted, the guests that you've booked, the, the subject matter we've tackled. I can't think of two days in a row where we've just had sort of bubblegum for the brain type stuff. Where I can't think of two or three days in a row where we haven't sunk our teeth into something uncomfortable or challenging at least once. And the show will continue to do that. And that's a commitment that we make to you. You can be in touch with us anytime. Talk at ryanjesperson.com. Let us know what you think about what you're hearing. Let us know what you think about the direction you'd like the show to go in. Let us know if this is resonating with you personally. This is what we care about. If, you, if, you, if you've noticed the types of guests that we book on this show and the types of conversations we have, firsthand lived experience carries such great value. And we do sincerely want to hear what you have to say. We want to let you know that this week, at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge are going to be ready for you. If you want to shop online, that's great. If you're in person, they're ready to go. Their inventory's looking better now than it has in the last two years. Car dealerships have had a heck of a time getting those lots filled up. Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge ready, whether it's a Jeep, whether you're downsizing based on fuel costs, or whether you're looking for the next thing to pull your holiday trailer, you can find them right now ready to go at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Our friends at Friesen Brothers want to remind you that they've got some great specials coming up in the lead up to Easter, including a very special all-you-can-eat Easter dinner at select Friesen Brothers locations. You can find all the details. See if the Friesen Brothers in your community 
is one of those offering this all-you-can-eat dinner coming up at Friesen.com. And while you're there shopping at the Friesen Brothers stores, keep an eye out for some of the special Alberta products that they're featuring, including Alberta honey. A lot of Alberta-grown options in the vegan and vegetarian aisle, and of course, they're real butchers with the Alberta beef, pork, chicken, turkey, and everything else you've come to expect at Friesen Brothers. Well, as we look at the conflict, the war in Ukraine, Russia's attacks on that sovereign nation, you may wonder, should we really be talking about sports right now? But what you cannot ignore is that sports play a huge role in international diplomacy. And oftentimes, individual athletes find themselves in the spotlight, whether they crave that or not. Dr. David Black is the Pearson Professor of International Development Studies and a professor of political science at Dalhousie University in Halifax. He's done a ton of work on sport and international relations, including sports, mega events, sanctions, boycotts, and sport in diplomacy. This guy knows what he's talking about. Dr. Black, thank you for making time for us and welcome to Real Talk. Thanks very much, Ryan. It's great to be here. It's probably, I guess, a fair question. You know, with with war going on, uh, with a country under attack, should we really be talking about sports? But sometimes sports is life, isn't it? Well, I think that's a really important point. Actually, sports resonates with people because it is woven into the fabric of our our everyday lives. Uh, And sport is often being politicized as it is being in the present moment. And it's a way of, of uh, disrupting the common sense of, and, the, and the sense of social isolation uh, that is a part of the conflict that's raging around Russia and Ukraine now. Let's, uh, I want to play a quick clip, uh, probably, well, at least in my orbit. Alex Ovechkin's the most famous Russian athlete on planet Earth, but there, there are probably others. But, but he was asked, I mean, he was hounded uh, for quite some time, a number of games in a row, and his Washington Capitals were on the road. People were saying, when is... Ovi going to speak. He's been supportive of Vladimir Putin in past. Of course, there's dynamics there. We'll get you to touch on, Doctor. But but finally, the reporters got him on the record talking about the war. Um, obviously, it's a hard situation. Um, you know, um, I have lots of friends in Russia and uh, Ukraine, and it's hard to see uh, the war. Like, I hope uh, soon it's going to be over and um, there's going to be uh, peace in the whole world. Please, no more war. You know, um, so it doesn't matter uh, who is in the war, uh, Russia, Ukraine, and different countries. Uh, I think we live in a world like uh, we have to live in peace and uh, uh, great, uh, great world. Doctor, should an athlete like Alex Ovechkin have to speak to this? I mean, is he accountable for you know a political leader that he's been supportive in the past? How do you sift through this? Uh, there's no evading the fact that uh, athletes are, are, especially professional athletes of Alex Ovechkin's prominence, are, um, are public figures. They, they are going to be asked to speak on these issues. Uh, Ovechkin's in a very difficult position. Obviously, everybody knows that he's been aligned historically with, uh, with Vladimir Putin. Um, he, there's a lot of Russians, frankly who are supportive of, of Vladimir Putin. We don't know how many, of course, because the information is so difficult to, to, to uh, discern. Uh, but um, he's also has to be concerned about his family at home. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, he has to be prepared to speak uh, and he has to be aware of the environment that he's, he's speaking in. And this will be become a factor in the way political contestation uh, is organized around this, this, this uh, invasion, this war. This is uh, probably one of the higher profile stories when you talk about athletes involved, uh, sometimes against their will. WNBA star Brittany Griner uh, had her detention extended, her detention in Russia extended by a court near Moscow. Now, until the middle of May, uh, she was originally detained at a Moscow airport mid-February after Russian authorities said that a search of her luggage revealed cannabis vape cartridges it could carry a penalty of 10 years in prison i'm not sure if anybody actually believes that or not but is is she a casualty here of this war in a sense i mean is is, is she being used as a pawn by the russians i, I think i think probably yes I, I mean i think there's uh you know she's been back and forth to russia she's been playing there for years uh this the timing of this suggests that there was uh, uh you know a desire to uh, 
accumulate a pond that could be used as a small cog in the much larger process of, of, of uh, positioning and skirmishing around uh, this conflict. Has there been a, I mean, is the, has there been a long history as you take a look at how athletes have, have become intertwined or involved in, in geopolitical circumstances? Is, is this old news in a way? I mean, do you think that there were a lot of other Russians, North American, uh, you know, athletes in particular, I should say, in Russia or in and around Russia that were probably hearing from their agents, their general managers, telling them to get the hell out of there as soon as possible? In terms of Russia specifically, sorry, Brian, can you... I, I, I just, yeah, uh, loud and clear. You can still see me. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that they were being coached, as they always are, about how to anticipate how this is going to go down. I, I think all, all of us were, um, well, not all of us, many of us were surprised by the magnitude of the, the, uh, the invasion uh, the magnitude of the conflict, the magnitude, frankly, of the crime under international law that's being perpetrated. Uh, and that's created um, a level of, of interest uh, and a focus on international sport uh, that we we've, haven't we've seen for, for a long time. Uh, and so uh, the, the shock, I'm sure, was quite profound. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm sure they've been prepared for, uh, for, uh, to, be, to be able to speak on this issue. Doctor, what, uh, Andre Rublev, the, the Russian tennis star that in my mind, this is one of the most powerful things I think I've ever seen, certainly mm. from an athlete uh, at a tennis tournament. He's ranked number seven in the world, by the way. He, mm. he, he goes, he finds a Sharpie and he writes on this camera lens. Uh, please, no war, no war, please. Um, just mm. absolutely powerful. What sort of a risk like to put that into perspective for us? First of all, what sort of an impact could that have and what sort of a risk? Uh, did a guy like that take in doing that? No war, please. Yeah. yeah, super hard to know the degree of risk that he's running. And there's been a lot of coverage of this. Uh, you know, I think that these guys are, are outside of the country. Uh, they are to a, a high degree protected because of their notoriety. Uh, this will be, you know, any kind of attempt to, um, uh, to ostracize or to uh, intimidate them will, uh, will blow back in some ways. Uh, nevertheless, the risk is real, especially to their families uh, and especially to their uh, to the people that, that are around them in, in Russia. So uh, and of course, that risk is growing uh, as the uh, legal environment in Russia becomes more and more restrictive as the, uh, the, the as new laws are passed to criminalize these kinds of uh, statements. So uh, it's it's the risk is real, uh, but it's it's limited uh, for someone like him. It's a power, the point that you make is really important. It comes back to your original question. This is a really, really powerful signal. And athletes have an important platform. There's no evading it. The idea that somehow uh, athletes can be spared uh, their role in, in relation to international politics um, is no longer one that is that can be viably defended. There's athletes will face sanctions too. I mean, Russian teams are are banned from you know pretty high profile tournaments that are coming, including the World Junior Hockey Tournament. Uh, I'm I'm curious to know on an individual level, you know, there are, there are Russian athletes as well that are showing support for what's happening right now, for showing support for the invasion, showing support for the attack. I mean, the, the International Gymnastics Federation, as an example, condemned Russian gymnast Ivan Kuliak's what they called shocking behavior in wearing that Z symbol. We'll show it to you right here, this this Z. And, and Doctor, maybe we can provide some context for us here. This was at the Apparatus World Cup in Qatar uh, back on March 5th. The symbol, I, I, I suppose, showing support for the invasion as he took to the podium following winning bronze on the parallel bars. Is, is my assessment fair? Is that a show of support? I, I, it almost seems undeniable. Oh, to me. totally. But, but what's, the, what's the appropriate response from, you know, for starters, the International Gymnastics Federation? Well, the International Gymnastics Federation is now banned, as all other international federations have, uh, has banned Russian, Russians from competing. So this will never happen again as long as those sanctions persist. Um, you know, it's, it's, it is a kind of under sport law, as it were, under, under the, uh, the provisions of the International Olympic Committee. Um, you are not allowed to, to make political statements or political displays, uh, in, on the field of play or on uh, a podium or in this, in, in the stadium space. Uh, so this was, this was, um, a, clearly a violation of the norms and, and rules of sport. Uh, but more than that, it was an obvious statement of support for Vladimir Putin, which was bound to be contentious. And I think the, the key point here is that we have to bear in mind 
that many Russians and many Russian athletes who uh, have been uh, enabled uh, by the Russian government uh, are supportive still of Vladimir Putin uh, as the leader of their country. Doctor, generally speaking, as this conflict continues, as this war continues, what's the appropriate approach uh, from international sports bodies, governing bodies, uh, when it comes to finding that balance between, you know, you, you've got Russia already. I mean, in the last Olympic Games, they're, they're not competing as Russia, right? They're, they're competing as a, as a flagless entity. Everybody knows it's Russia, but still. You'll have other tournaments where Russian athletes will not be welcomed, and then you have individual Russian athletes that will continue to compete. And I think even for sports fans, it's, 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 it's a fine line to walk. It's a tough balance. I've seen people saying, I don't know, is it fair to boo Alex Ovechkin? Is it fair to boo, you know, Russian tennis stars? I don't know. I mean, how do you, generally speaking, I mean, what does this go for as long as the conflict lasts and everybody forgets about it? I mean, how do you wrap your mind around it? Yeah, super good questions. I mean, the, the, what's happened to Russia in international sport uh, is, really without precedent. There have been uh, states that have been boycotted in the past, the most prominent one being South Africa, but that was a boycott that unfolded and built over a period of decades. Uh, In a matter of days, Russia has been banned from international competition uh, under all sort of international federations that are under the IOC umbrella. Uh, It's been uh, prevented from continuing to compete for the FIFA World Cup, which is a huge deal. Uh, It has lost the hosting rights to international events like the UEFA Champions League uh, final uh, that was scheduled to be held in St. Petersburg, like the Formula One Grand Prix in Sochi. So the the degree of isolation has never happened in this way before. I think that those measures are um, uh, are appropriate under the circumstances. Um, they were a response to a very specific uh, violation of international law. Uh, they, of course, have particular political failings because of the fact that it's on the edge of Europe uh, and, and as you know, is um, the, much of the response has been driven by countries that Russia was going to be competing against. The, the, the big question comes when it, uh, when it comes to, uh, to uh, individual athletes who are competing on their own terms as individuals uh, in tennis, uh, players playing for hockey teams. Um, you know, we have a variety of athletes and prominent athletes in, in many sports who are, are playing as individuals. And, and then we get into our own sort of human rights standards. I think, you know, the booing, um, that will be probably inevitable uh, to some degree. Um, and, and obviously we see this particularly in, in places like Western Canada. Uh, and, and athletes have to put up with this. Uh, uh, it has a particular sharp edge uh, in, in relation to the current moment, but in general, the degree of isolation that is being imposed on Russia has, has never really been seen in this way before. And it's, it's, a, it's a reflection of the magnitude of, of the concern with the situation in Ukraine. Yeah, no kidding. Uh, doctor, we really appreciate your informed analysis of this. Thanks for making time for us this morning uh, from the beautiful city of Halifax. It's nice to see you on the show. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks very much. You bet. That's Dr. David Black, who's the Pearson Professor of International Development Studies a political science prof as well as at uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax. Uh, We're going to be talking federal politics. We're going to be talking about that continued war in Ukraine, Canada's involvement there. And we'll talk about the the leadership race, conservative leadership race. How about some COVID restrictions, too? We'll make some time for that when uh, Supriya Devetti and Brian Lilly join me in just a couple of minutes. This show happens because we have the amazing support of sponsors like the team at Park Power. Right now is a great time for you to go check out and compare the rates that they're offering for internet, electricity, and natural gas. Fixed rates, variable rates. I'm not the expert, but it seems to me like fixed rates is probably the play right now. You're going to want to go check them out online as prices continue. People are looking at natural gas, the the administration costs of electricity going, oh boy, right? If you want to put even more money in your pocket, use the promo code 2022-REALTALK. You'll save $70 off your first bill when you bring your business over to Park Power at parkpower.ca. Now, when you're with Park Power, if you also happen to be doing business with Kubi Energy, if you've got Kubi Renewable Energy taking care of your solar panel install, you know these two companies are working together to make sure that you can have a solar buyback rebate. I mean, so many great opportunities with Real Talk sponsors collaborating on stuff like this. 
Kubi Energy is proudly headquartered out of Edmonton and Kamloops, BC, which means they can take on your projects across Western Canada with their Tesla certified installers, journeyman electricians and apprentices. And of course, they're doing agricultural, industrial, commercial, and residential installs. You can check out their products and services. Get a free quote online today right now at kubienergy.ca. And if you're one of those families that right now knows you have a loved one who needs care, you want to make sure they're getting their medication on time. You want to make sure that they actually ate their breakfast. Is their hair getting brushed? Are their teeth getting brushed? Are people talking to them? Are they having meaningful conversations? But you don't want them in a long-term care home? Infinity Healthcare could be the answer. They take pride in building relationships with their clients and their customers. Their personality matching process ensures that it's always a perfect fit. You can find them online today. Learn more about how they operate at infinity-8.ca. Of course, all of our sponsors under the Sponsors tab on our website at ryanjesperson.com. Well, I'm looking forward to connecting with these two. Uh, We've got uh, Brian Lilly and Sapria Devetti coming up in just a little bit. Uh, Sapria, of course, you know, on this show a whole bunch. She's a member of our editorial board. You've seen her on CBC's Power and Politics, the Toronto Star, and other papers. Brian Lilly, of course, a well-read and prominent national columnist with the Toronto Sun as well. Both of them coming up in just a couple of minutes here on the show. Uh, We're going to get into stories that matter. Of course, when you take a look through the big, wide lens of the federal political landscape, but also when you, when you get two voices, like the ones that we're about to feature, you never know where that conversation might go. That's kind of the beauty. It's kind of the intent of the real talk roundtable, uh, that the conversation can meander, the conversation can evolve, and, and who knows maybe where it might end up. So those two are coming up in just a little bit. Other stories making news today too, though. Sarah Hoyles, there's an interesting development heading up to April 9th. We've got the leadership Race the leadership review for Premier Jason Kenney and some interesting notes right now with regards to what political staffers are being invited to do. What's this, a day off? Is that the deal? Ryan, I have to. I have to do this. Um, I have just been messaged by Captain Kobe. He put it on Instagram, uh, on Twitter saying, I see everyone on here defending Sarah, but you all seen her being racist towards all white men with beards, right? I need you to call him out, Ryan. There's no such thing as reverse racism. There is no such thing as reverse discrimination. I need you to call him out. He's dangerous. He's targeting me. And he's, this is inaccurate, unfair, and a smear. And I need you to call him out. Yeah. Um, well, this is... This is exactly what the problem is. When women stand up and ask to be heard and say things that are hard for white men to hear... This is what comes back at them. And he's dangerous because he has such a platform, which we helped to create. Okay. So let's, let me This ask is why I was dangerous. To, I was scared to come on today because I, I need you to stand up. What, um, with regards to using this opportunity, um, uh, with regards to what you want Captain Kobe or people to hear... Like, what's, what's the specific message? What, what, what do you specifically want to say? What, what, with regards to me calling him out, I don't have background here. I, 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 obviously, I just read it to you, Ryan. It, okay, I just okay, read okay, it to okay. you. Okay, so yeah. So, I mean, I'm just seeing it. I haven't had a chance to formulate my thoughts. But, but what's the message? Like, what, what do you, what's the most important message you want people focusing on right now? What do you want people to hear right now? I've said it, Ryan. I don't have the same platform as you. I will be discounted as a white woman being hysterical. You have the platform. He listens to you. This is white privileged males yeah. that will only listen to each other. No, but I want you to feel supported right now. And I'm standing here. So that's here why I'm you. asking you. But so tell what, him so it's wrong. Tell him that you're not a racist. I, we, 20 minutes tell ago him. we talked about that. I said that specific. I, I, I want to be clear. I'm understanding. Say Kobe, Captain Kobe. Yeah. Knock it off. Yeah. Stop. Stop. Full stop. Yeah. It is not acceptable. You are putting a target on Sarah's back. I mean, this is... This, 
this is a masterclass. This is a case yeah. study yeah. in in what misogyny is and how white women. Sarah, I want to be Please, clear. Ryan, you have, you have my it. full you have my full support right now. Say I'm, it to Kobe. Okay, okay. Just hang on a second. We're having a conversation. And I'm conceding this platform to have this conversation. And I'm happy to have it. You have my full support. I fifteen minutes ago looked into the camera and credited you as the reason why this show has has taken on so many meaningful and difficult conversations. And there's a lot of nuance to this conversation in this circumstance. Clearly, the way that Kobe's messaging is making you feel no. is absolutely that is not you can't say I'm sorry that he's making you no, feel no, no, that no. way. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying, Sarah. That's just what you said, Sarah. I'm saying clearly it indicates that. OK. All right. Well, this I mean, this is real for sure. Obviously, um, Kobe, you can see the impact that this is having. I don't have the background here. Um Obviously, didn't expect this to happen. Um, I don't have the uh, Kobe. I don't. I don't know what was said except for that. Calling Sarah racist is completely off base, and um, I uh, Sarah has my full support, and we're lucky to have Sarah on this team. Sarah's added a ton of value to this team. I condemn any online attacks or bullying of Sarah. Obviously, this has been a, a remarkable last 25 hours or so um and there's a lot of learning going on and a lot of talking going on and uh i mean i yeah i i i'm i'm obviously you can imagine the circumstance i mean right i don't i don't know the background between these two i knew i do know that there was no social media interact the interaction between the two of them for a long time and obviously this morning it's happening and so you know walk it back kobe please um, and, uh, with regards to everybody else, um, you know, I mean, this is an unprecedented circumstance for me as a host. You can let me know what you think right now. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing my best to, to show my support for my teammate here and for my colleague, Sarah Hoyles. Um, we're just going to hard transition into a conversation. Uh, this is, I, I imagine our panelists probably right now are going, what on earth? But, uh, this is real life. I mean, this is real talk. Holy smokes, isn't it? Sapria Devetti is uh, senior counsel at Enterprise Canada. Um, she's the director of policy engagement at the Center for Media, Technology, and Democracy. You've seen her on a ton of national shows, including CBC's Power and Politics. Brian Lilly, a political columnist for the Toronto Sun, broadcaster, journalist, author. Grateful to have both of you here on the show. Uh, Supriya, we were just talking uh, to Dr. David Black uh, out of Dalhousie University about you know the sort of the sport angle when it comes to sport sanctions or what have you um, on Russia. And of course, a lot of people right now in Canada trying to look around them and evaluate with war happening halfway around the world you feel a little bit helpless but what should the canadian response look like what should the canadian response be a number of weeks into this conflict right now how are you sorting that out how are you processing that I, yeah i mean look the images and the video and everything that's coming out from ukraine is just incredibly gutting and heart-wrenching to to watch and to see and there can be this feeling of i think helplessness that is is almost overwhelming right like folks don't really on this side of the world really know what to do or how to show support and i i think one of the most important things that that canadians can do more more generally is just to understand that the sanctions that are, you know, have been leveled at Russia, um, they're going to hurt. They're going to hurt us. They're going to hurt our pocketbook. They're going to hurt our wallets. We're already seeing, you know, the increases in terms of gas prices. We're going to see increases in terms of food and other commodities um, rise. Um, and I, I think we need to be prepared for that. And part of that is also having our, our government um, really have the backs of, of Canadians uh, to say that this is we're doing the right thing. We're doing the moral thing. We're doing the ethical thing. Um, and just to ensure that for folks that will need the help, because there will certainly be folks that will need the help, um, will get the help that that they need to keep going this route. Brian, how do you how do you how do you analyze or how do you assess uh, the role that Canada has played to this point? We're not we're not the biggest dog on the block, uh, mm -hmm. but, but how has Canada been doing in your assessment? Well, I, I think that we've been good in terms of pushing on you know, some of our allies to do better on sanctions. You know, there's been a, early on, there was a, a real reluctance among some of our European allies, because of course, it's going to hurt them going into an economic war with Russia, then it, it will hurt us. And so, you know, we were out quicker than 
than other countries, Prime Minister Trudeau, Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christy Freeland, joining with the UK and then eventually the US and others in, in trying to remove Russia from the SWIFT banking system, calling for harsher sanctions. And you, there were calls, you know, why isn't Roman Abramovich, the, the owner of Chelsea Football Club most famously, but also part owner of a company that owns a steel mill in Regina, why hasn't he been sanctioned quicker? Well, because it takes time and it needs to be coordinated. So I, I think that we've been doing well on, on the sanctions front. I feel like we could be doing more on the, the military front and, and there's some steps we could take there. Um, I'm, I'm you know, impressed with Defense Minister Anand, less so with her cabinet colleague, uh, Melania Jolie saying that, you know, we, we're just not a military force anymore. I think even Minister Anand took exception with those comments, but on the sanctions front, we've been doing a good job and heading in the right direction. Do, uh, Sabrina, how do you see Canada's role as like a military force or not? I've, you know, I've been sort of gauging a bunch of people's different opinions on this. In particular, I'd love both of your takes on uh, Canada's Arctic sovereignty claims too. I mean, whether or not Canada yeah. can even really truly protect its north. Uh, do you get the sense as a Canadian uh, that Canada is where it needs to be with regards to military capabilities, including contributions to NATO? No, I mean, the short answer to that is, is no, right? Uh, uh, the, the problem, though, is that it's it's a multifaceted issue. Um, it, it, we can't overnight just increase our defense spending. We can't overnight just fix our procurement issues. We can't overnight just fix the personnel issues when it comes to recruitment and getting, you know, actual physical bodies into the armed forces. And, you know, you mentioned Arctic sovereignty, and that's, that's a huge issue, right, with respect to Russia in particular. I mean, Canada obviously has quite a bit in common with the Ukraine. With, with with the Ukrainian people. And it's not just because so much of the diaspora is here. Um, I, I, you know, we, we do share uh, concerns with respect to our sovereignty. And, and I think, you know, it's interesting that uh, this was first came onto my radar like over a decade ago um, in a law, international law class that I was taking in, in law school. And it seems that we've made very little stride um, on that front in the last decade or so. And it's, it's increasing worrying because, of course, with uh, climate change induced Arctic free waters, it's a whole heck of a lot easier um, for someone to just go up there and plant a fat flag and, you know, then we're, we're, we're in some ma major tr trouble here. And, and I think in order to, you know, have those types of conversations about all the multifaceted issues that I, that I sort of laid out, we're going to have to have a grown up discussion about it um, and not just finger point at, you know, well, team blue did this or team red did this. It's like, okay, kids, you're both terrible. Hmm. Um, and to solve <laughs> the issue, we need to actually come to the table and, and, you know, be, be bringing solutions and not just finger pointing. Yeah, Brian, is it but is it is it too polarized these days? I mean, is it too partisan these days or can we have the conversation Sapri is suggesting? I mean, I would hope so. I'm glad people are finally talking about Arctic sovereignty other than in the, you know, uh, you know, a dispute over Hans Island. That would normally be the only time we would talk about it. This tiny island that we argue with uh, Denmark over because they claim it's part <laughs> of Greenland and we say it's part of ours. Look, it, Russia has made it clear that they have a very different view of what to do in the Arctic than we do. In Canada, we look at the Arctic and we say, okay, well, we want to preserve it. And even among, you know, the part of the Canadian population that says, yes, but there's also resources up there. They want to, that part of the population wants to develop them responsibly. Russia doesn't care about that. Uh, we've also got China, which more than a decade ago said, well, we don't really have an Arctic coastline. We're not an Arctic country, but we have 20% of the population, so we should have 20% of the Arctic, and we want to go in there and develop it. This is why we needed to be taking the Arctic seriously, whether it is through military sovereignty, which is part of why I thought buying the F-35s was a good thing. Here we are seven years later. We still don't have anything that can fly up there that can you know, dissuade the Russians who regularly do encroach to try and, and push their sovereignty. Um, it's why going through the United Nations, we didn't just want to leave it up to whatever the United Nations bureaucrats said. We wanted to forcefully make our case and we should have been doing that. But there's part of our foreign policy apparatus in Canada that doesn't believe that we should be doing these things. And, and they have argued with both blue team and red team against Canada's interest, I feel at times. And, and so we need whoever is in government at the time to be forceful on Canada's interest. It's in the interest of the whole world for Canada to have a good stake of the Arctic uh, waters and land, because I think we'll be better stewards 
than the Russians. They will take as much of it as we let them. And I don't think that's the right way to operate. I want to talk to both of you about the conservative leadership race. And I don't know if either of you will assess it as a done deal yet. I suspect you won't. But let's talk about the interim leader first. And this might be a 10 second conversation. Um, Sapria, everybody was saying uh, Candace Bergen didn't stand long enough or clap long enough after Zelensky, Ukraine's president Zelensky addressed Canada's parliament. And they said she's the only one. I'm seeing this on. She's the only one not standing. She's the only one not clapping. She's not clapping enough. And on our show, we were trying to say, well, what's the nuance here? I mean, is, is that fair? Maybe her hands were tired. Maybe she wasn't uninspired. Maybe she didn't realize the camera was on her. Was that something that jumped out at you or no? Much ado about nothing. No, I think it's much ado about nothing. Like yeah. there's lots of things you can throw at yeah, Candace Bergen or whomever your parliamentarian of choice that you want to like crap on for the day. Um, I don't think standing for long enough or not clapping long enough is is one of them. I also would point out that there are multiple journalists that were there um, that also said that whatever clip was shown um, didn't necessarily reflect what was happening. Um, so and, and like I wasn't she like waiting for her turn to speak or something like there all these issues. So I, I think in the age of social media and the age of like wanting to be outraged for the sake of being outraged, um, we get these little snippets and, you know, folks may feel better, but at the end of the day, it's not really adding anything to the general discourse. And that's what we were, that's what I was trying to be, the argument I was trying to make on the show, Brian, and, and let me ask you this in even more of a focused way. When, when, when you're deciding mm -hmm. to write one of your columns, uh, you know, a ton of people across the country are going to read. You, you got to pick your spots, right? And the argument I was making on this show is that if, if you're trying to make something out of nothing and you keep trying to do that, then, then ultimately your arguments get less and less effective. Yeah. You know, so how do you decide it, it, when you're going to sink your teeth into something? If you're going to pick on her for clapping, then, you know, OK, are you going to pick on her for the color of her shoes the next day? How low, how ridiculous do you get? Um, the fact is that across the Canadian political spectrum, outside of the extreme left and the extreme right, neither of which are represented in Parliament, um, we have a fairly unified view of dealing with Ukraine. And there was you know, an outpouring of support from all parties when it came to that. But when, yeah, you're looking and saying, OK, do I criticize the prime minister for A? Um, OK, well, is that a little petty? If, it's, if you're getting into the petty territory, people are going to tune you out. And I, I got received a bit of pushback from some readers saying, why are you saying nice things about Justin Trudeau over Ukraine? I said, well, because I called for certain things to be done. He's doing them. Uh, there seems to be uniformity in believing these things should be done. And some of them were not, you know, steps he initially wanted to take, but he's on the right page now. You give people credit for that, because if you don't give them credit when they do the right thing, when you're criticizing them, it takes on it, it has less force. And so you've got to be fair. You know, Trudeau's team may disagree on whether I'm fair. Uh, Supriya may, you may, but you know, you've got to you know, not pick on the, the tiny minor things. Otherwise, you know, nobody's paying attention to you. I feel like Supriya Brian invited you to assess whether or not you think he's fair. <laughs> Brian Lilly, secret liberal. No, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But yeah, look, I, I mean, whatever. I, I think everyone will obviously come at issues with their own sort of particular, um, you know, preconceived biases. We all have them. I clearly have them. You know, Ryan, you clearly have them. And I think that's fine. I think as long as we acknowledge them and we don't pretend to be in some sort of vacuum of objective neutrality at all times, like we're these robots, I, I think we can all be adults about it. And people can, you know, read what Brian writes. They can and read what I write and certainly formulate their own conclusions about where each of us come from on any given issue. Is this, uh, Brian, is this a done deal? Is Pierre Polyev the, the, uh, the heir apparent, the leader in waiting for the Conservatives? And if so, I mean, polling back on March 10th, so, you know, just over a week ago, shows him at 41% among uh, decided Conservatives. Josh Charest second at 10%, Pierre McKay, who's out at nine. So maybe that makes Charest's number bump up a little bit. I don't know, but you still got to have a race. I mean, there's a reason why everybody votes, right? Is this Pierre's to lose? It is his to lose. I think, um, you know, I appreciate that Leger went into the field and did that. It, it's tough to poll on leadership races in any party because the people who say, well, I vote for this party and I'd support leader A, B, or C, are they party members? Is their membership up to date by the time voting day comes around? Will they cast a ballot? These are all the questions that we don't know the answers to. Um, Pierre is the perceived front runner. 
I think he is the front runner, but he's also behaving in a way that's rather strange to me. If he is so far out ahead, why is he punching down at Jean Charest and Patrick Brown? And why is he doing it so hard and personal and getting into the mud, basically writing liberal attack ads if either one of them wins? And you know some of their responses, like Patrick Brown's, writing attack ads for uh, you know if Pierre Polyev wins. It, it's a bizarre leadership race like I haven't seen. It reminds me a bit of the liberal leadership race in 2006 when they wrote attack ads for Stephen Harper's conservatives, which served Stephen Harper's conservatives very well, except these guys are being nastier than the liberals were when uh, Michael Ignatieff was fam famously saying, Stefan, you didn't get it done. This is, uh, I suppose, obviously, I mean, every leadership race, I mean, this is probably the, the, the least profound thing that I'll say all week, but a, but a leadership <laughs> race is an opportunity, if not an impetus, to put a bit of a different stamp on a party, right? To define a party a little bit differently. And, and Supri, I know that opponents of Pierre Polyev within conservative circles will say, well, you're the guy that was out, you know, you and others were out, you know, congratulating the truckers during the occupation, supporting the truckers with your tweets and these types of things in your, in your attacks or your opposition to the government. And, and ultimately, you might suggest that that's not a winning formula uh, to try to form government, that, that ultimately it could be nailing the conservatives' feet to the floor. Do you think it's a dangerous direction for the conservative party to go if indeed Pierre Polyev becomes leader and is assessed as that type of a leader? Yeah, I think so. But I, I would, you know, widen your comments um, and kind of pick up on something Brian said, which, which is just that it, it has, I think it has less to do with any one specific instance or any one specific support of whatever was happening in the news cycle and speaks more broadly to the fact that, you know, Pierre is, is very much perceived inside and outside of Ottawa as very partisan, a bit of an attack dog and like kind of dickish, right? And so it's like, um, you couldn't necessarily say that about Andrew Scheer, you couldn't necessarily say that about Aaron O'Toole, but you can certainly say that about Pierre. That doesn't mean he's not like a good constituent uh, MP. It doesn't mean he's not a good dad, good husband, whatever, good friend, what have you. But in terms of leadership qualities, um, I don't know if he necessarily embodies them. He certainly rallies and is able to galvanize and really invigorate a certain uh, faction of the conservative membership. But, you know, as we've seen time and time again, you need to win over the like suburban wine moms that live around me that I see at the park. Um, and I don't know if a guy like Pierre does that necessarily. Um, and, and I would just say as well with the general talk about the, the leadership stuff, what makes it very hard uh, to really pin down is that folks aren't robots, right? So you can say to certain, um, let's say Leslie Lewis's supporters, she can say like, yeah, put Pierre on the second ballot or put uh, person X on the second ballot. But people aren't necessarily going to follow that, right, um, to a T. And so that does also complicate some of this um, math and some of the polling in terms of who's ahead. But I think it's, it's clear in terms of caucus support, in terms of, um, you know, just getting out of the gate first, that Pierre is very much clearly uh, the front runner. And I would say by a pretty wide margin, but that doesn't mean it's a sure thing. Uh, Brian, uh, I don't want to assume that you're going to say conservatives can win under Pierre Polyev, but but how do conservatives win under Pierre Polyev? What's the strategy got to be? Where do you pick? I mean, like, like Sapria is saying, you're, you're talking, you know, Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, right? You, you got these big centers where you got to convince mm -hmm. these folks. And I've been surprised by some of the people that have come out and said that they're excited by, uh, by Pierre, including some people that, I, you know, I like Sapria's description of them as suburban wine moms. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a, it's a takeoff of the, the soccer mom. No, they're not playing soccer anymore. They're sitting no. back in COVID, <laughs> sipping on a, a, a Chardonnay or Merlot. It's great. Some of them, I, I've been surprised at some of them coming forward. I've also been surprised by some long-term supporters of Pierre's who've told me privately, um, you know, I'm, I don't like the way he's going. So, you know, th there's a bit of fluidity in there. People that I didn't think would ever, uh, you know, be drawn to his camp are, but that's the key. And, you know, winning over swing voters does not mean abandoning your principles. It means being authentic. It means explaining your principles and what you want to do clearly. Every time I write conservatives have to pick a leader that can win, I get told, well, you just want to pick a liberal now. Yes, suddenly, you know, Supri is right. I'm Brian Lilly, uh, closet <laughs> liberal. I, I, I have no idea on what planet that sounds like a realistic thing, but you know, 
I'm sorry, if you're not picking a leader to win, to take you from the 33 to 34% that you've got right now to the 37 to 39% you need to be in power, then you're picking the next leader of the conservative debating society. So yeah. can Pierre Polyev win? Absolutely. Can Jean Charest win in a general election against Trudeau? Absolutely. They would do it in very different ways, but both of them could. Trudeau is, you know, he, he quickly went to Ukraine and I, I agree with him going to Ukraine. And, and supported him being there. It's what the prime minister should have done, regardless of who's in the office. But he was coming off of a, a bad situation. Even people that didn't like the trucker protest didn't like how he handled it, um, even if they supported the Emergencies Act. So he pivoted quickly it, and he overplayed the photo op thing, but he did that because he knew he was in trouble. And he only won with 32% of the popular vote last time. And he only won by getting those suburban wine moms in Markham and in Surrey and places surrounding Toronto and Vancouver to pivot to him in the last moments of the last election. If, if he's in that much trouble, yeah, so Poiliev could beat him. Uh, Sheree could beat him. I, I don't know if Patrick Brown will win, but you know he could beat him. Trudeau is, is not as popular, and I'm hearing that from liberals, both you know the, the old Martin guys and the old Cretchen guys and people that worked in those camps who are now becoming elder statesmen in the party are they're frustrated with him because they're they're saying you know it's all about him you know you talk about putting a new stamp on the party that's been going on for several leaders in both parties for a while but he has really rebranded the party around him as opposed to it being about the liberal party it's it's kind of the justin party um so he's got to wear that for good and for bad a couple of years ago it was great now it's not going so great in 2011, it was great for Stephen Harper to be Team Harper. In 2015, that was the worst thing you could be. Things change. Yeah, no kidding. And and, and Supreme, I mean, depending on who you talk to, but there's always the rumblings, or maybe it's just another obvious statement that there there are, I think, some potential leaders in waiting. I mean, everybody, you know, I mean, one of the names that you hear oftentimes is Christia Freeland, and people will say that it's probably not even going to be Justin Trudeau that leads the Liberals into the next election. Who knows? Maybe he goes for another term and if he loses he steps down i don't know but i mean do you do, do you think that there is that dynamic within that party that the, the future leader is already being groomed or maybe it's the worst kept secret around the cabinet table maybe already everybody knows who it is i mean look i think freeland is an obvious sort of name um for a myriad of reasons right that gets sort of thrown in as uh the the next sort of heir apparent when it comes to Liberal leader, but I would just say that you know the Liberals have a pretty strong bench um, in terms of uh, who could that possibly be, um, and that's not to detract whatsoever anything from Freeland's credentials. But I, I would say that there are a number of of uh, you know either front benchers for the the, the current um, cabinet or in, in past iterations of, of cabinet, or even folks that could probably come out of uh, you know political retirement that would be somewhat interesting. The thing that I worry a little bit um, when it comes to, you know, the dynamic that Brian sort of described is that it's right. Once you make an entire party about one person, then once that one person sort of, you know, steps aside or is um, waning in, in popularity, then it tends to drag the, the whole sort of brand down. But I would just say in the last election, for example, particularly in Quebec, you saw the Liberals really um, advertise and really put forward their Quebec MPs and their Quebec cabinet ministers front and center. And it wasn't so much a, a Trudeau show. It really was a, here's the team liberal and here's team liberal Quebec for you. And uh -huh. I would imagine that's kind of the way that they're going to go in the next little bit. Interesting comment here from Jillian, who's watching us live. She says the problem with conservatives is by constantly underestimating Trudeau and writing stories that reduce his achievements, they've come to believe he's actually weak. Is that fair, Brian? I don't think he's weak. And I always tell people, don't underestimate him, including his intelligence. People like to say, well, he's a bimbo or a himbo or, you know, just say the man's stupid. Well, if he's so stupid, he's won three elections and he won the, the, the liberal leadership. You know, is Justin Trudeau the intellectual heavyweight his father was? No. Is, is he vacant? No. You know, you know, I've talked to him one-on-one. -on -one. Um, not everybody's had that opportunity, but he is a smart guy. I've talked to conservative uh, cabinet ministers in the Ford government who've said the same things like, okay, you know, he, he can be impressive. Um, and he's obviously a fighter. So yeah, don't underestimate the guy. Uh, but, you know, he will find a scrappy way. I mean, that, that the end of that last, last election campaign was incredibly divisive. 
he basically campaigned against Alberta in Toronto and Vancouver suburbs saying, if you elect Aaron O'Toole, we're all going to die like people in Alberta are right now because Alberta was going through the big wave with COVID. And he used COVID in a you know politically very effective way, but a very divisive way as even his own Quebec MP, Joel Lightbound said later on, um, that's how he was able to micro target and get to that 32%. So the guy's a fighter and, and don't underestimate him. But he is, you know, getting long in the tooth as far as our traditional length of, of, of prime ministers and how long we, we let them go. And so are we looking at somebody else? Yeah, and I'll throw out some other names. Um, you know, uh, Melanie Jolie is apparently considering it. That's not someone I'd be happy with, but Anita Anand, who had some stumbles at the beginning of getting, you know, uh, uh, vaccines distributed across Canada, but then recovered quite well and is now doing, you know, when she was procurement minister. So she stumbled at the start, recovered, fixed things. That's a good sign of, of competence. She's now a defense minister, I think performing well so far, you know, we'll see, but you know, she's a real contender. Um, so we've got three women, Freeland, Anand, Jolie. We've also got uh, Francois-Philippe Champagne, or as I like to call him, Frankie Bubbles. He's the industry minister. Uh, very competent guy, considering a race as well. And Navdeep Baines is one of those names who I'm told would consider coming out of political retirement, used to be industry minister, left before the last election to uh, go back to the private sector and spend more time with family. Any of those names float your boat, Sapria, as, as a legit contender, one, one that raised, you raised your eyebrow with in particular? It, look, I like all of them. Um, so my Brian Lilly secret liberal sort of attack uh, <laughs> sticks for the time being. One other name I, I, I would throw in there, um, I, I think Karina Gould um, would make an excellent leader and would represent, you know, the younger faction of the party and could possibly galvanize uh, disaffected Trudeau voters from 2015 back into the fold. I, I actually find her to be the uh, the liberal version of of Pierre in in being the permanent attack dog, <laughs> and, and I was actually surprised when, with just one province left to go on the national childcare deal, that Trudeau shuffled her into that portfolio because she immediately turned around and, and while negotiations are going well with the Ford government, started attacking them uh, and and had to be reined in by PMO. So she has a bit of that flavor to her in terms of of being on the attack against her opponents. Um, I don't see that so much with uh, with Anand or Champagne or Baines. If you're just tuning in, joining us live streaming audio on the Mixler audio app, that's Brian Lilly, Sapria Devetti with me as well. Canada announced this week, the federal government, that uh, Canada will end its pre-entry COVID-19 testing requirement for fully vaccinated travelers by the end of the month. Mask mandates have been lifted in the majority of Canadian cities, and some people are doing their best to get back to normal. It doesn't mean that COVID's gone. As a matter of fact, hospital numbers and you know people are still getting sick people are still dying from it how are the two of you before we start getting into the high level stuff like the policy and the politics i mean how are you wrapping your minds around it sapria like when you go to the grocery store you're wearing a mask you're not wearing a mask i mean how how are you navigating it in your own personal life Look, I'm, I'm, I'm still wearing a mask and I'm still wearing a KN95 or a higher grade mask. And I will just say for full disclosure, I mean, my, I, my daughter's too young to be vaccinated. My husband is, you know, boosted, but he does have an autoimmune disease. And my in-laws um, also live with me. So, you know, they're, they're healthy, but I mean, they're old. So at a higher risk for, for COVID. So um, my personal risk is obviously going to be different from somebody who lives in a fully vaccinated and boosted household where everybody is healthy and fit and, and good to go. But I would just say that, you know, generally when you do have transmission rates as high as they still are, and I think Ontario today reported something like 2,500 cases officially, and according to our own, you know, um, chief medical officer of health, he said to assume the rate to be anywhere around like 10 times higher. So if you're assuming like 25,000 cases right now in Ontario, that's quite a bit of transmission that's still going on. That's try to, that's quite a bit of opportunity for the virus to continue to, you know, seek out the vulnerable, to find the vulnerable, but also to, continue to mutate, right? Um, and I think this is part of it where I get that we're all tired. You know, I'm fucking tired of the of the GD pandemic, right? We all are. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's finished with us. And I think we have to be mindful of that. And I think once you take something away as simple as, you know, wearing a mask, and I understand that it is annoying. Um, I find wearing a bra annoying, but I still do it. Um, and so I think that there are certain things that we can do that are somewhat lower barrier, right, in terms of our own personal freedoms, our own personal restrictions that we can continue to do to help curb transmission. 
And I think masks are one of them, but I get that there are a lot of people that disagree with me on that. Brian? Look, I, uh, I live in a building where there's a lot of seniors. And so I'm, you know, our building has been very COVID cautious, a condo building in the middle of downtown Toronto. And, but even though the board is mostly made up of a lot of the longtime residents and seniors, they're going with the provincial uh, you know, mandate as of Monday, we're dropping masks being mandatory. I am sure that I'm still going to be seeing a lot of people wearing masks in the building. And you know, I, there's gonna be certain places where, yeah, you might wanna be putting on a mask. But I will say I was at Leafs game uh, just uh, last night, not a lot of mask wearing. And, and so a lot of the public is feeling comfortable. Case numbers can still be high, but hospitalizations are down. I didn't know I had COVID and, um, about two months ago, two and a half months ago, until I went into hospital for something else. And of course, they test everyone that goes in. I oh, found right. out I had COVID. Didn't know. Wow. But I'm I'm one of those hospital. Uh, I I was hospitalized with COVID because they still weren't changing the the way they reported the the system. So you know, but I've got three shots. I'm you know uh, now I've had it, so I feel super immune. But not everyone's going to be that way, yeah. and you have to do your own risk assessment. And, and I actually love something that the Alberta government has done at Alberta Health. You can go on and you put in your age and you put in your, you know, do you have any of these medical conditions? And they list the ones that are, are most prominent for severe outcomes or c contributing to severe outcomes with COVID. And they tell you what your risk profile is and give you some advice. I, I think every government should be doing that because, you know, it, it we are at a point where we've got a good level of protection, fully understand what Sapria is talking about with, with her situation. My parents are snowbirds. They'll be coming back soon. They're in their late seventies. That's the target group for COVID. Always more careful with my parents than I am with, you know, younger coworkers or what have you, because you know, people over 80 have been 4% of the COVID cases in Ontario, but almost 60% of the deaths. That's an amazing statistic. And then you look at the fact that, you know, people who are, uh, you know, have autoimmune issues or have underlying conditions. We have to start talking about who is at real risk, not so that we can say, well, dismiss them and say, yeah, but it, it doesn't matter. It's just old people with three uh, underlying conditions. No, so that we can protect them, so that we can better understand. And that's what we need to do. Rather than pretending that a 22-year-old uh, university student who's healthy and fit and working out every day and on the varsity basketball team is at the same risk as someone in a long-term care facility. Let's be more open and realistic so that we can better understand and better protect and, and, and then do the right thing, which sometimes will be, you don't wanna wear a mask, but you're going to because you're near vulnerable people. Um, I've always enjoyed talking to the two of you. I want to acknowledge here, I'm going to be unfair to you as we wrap uh, because you are both in Ontario and we're here in Alberta <laughs> and I know you pay attention to as much as you possibly can, uh, but just a quick Coles Notes version. So, you know, Brian Jean, obviously former MP, you guys probably know the story, former MLA leader of the Wild Rose Party out of, uh, out of Fort McMurray, a resounding victory in a by-election in Fort McMurray. He re-enters the Alberta legislature, not even as a Trojan horse. He's not even hiding. He's not in the horse. He says he's coming in to basically dethrone Jason Kenney, he says that the party needs a new leader. It's somewhat of a remarkable circumstance leading up to the leadership review on April 9th. Supriya, does Alberta's premier, does Jason Kenney survive this leadership vote? They've got 10,000 people registered to vote on this. It's huge numbers. I'm going to say no. I'm going to say he doesn't survive just because I think the numbers um, are, are interesting already. I would imagine that if you're registered and motivated, you're probably more motivated by spite than you are for support. Um, so my answer is no. Brian? I'm, you know, I, I'm torn because uh, both of them are very good at organizing. If it was the average Alberta politician, I would say Jason Kenney survives no problem. And, and I'll tell you, average Alberta conservative, Ryan, let me explain why, and I'm going to insert and insult Alberta conservatives here. They often win by such a landslide that they're horrible political organizers. Yeah. Uh, and they just, well, I'm conservative, so I get the vote. Brian Jean, not your typical Alberta conservative. He had to organize when he was uh, at Wild Rose. He's had to organize before. So he's going to put up a fight. But Jason Kenney, I mean, he's been organizing his entire political life. So he knows what he's doing as well. I'm expecting a knife fight 
when uh, they get to Red Deer. Yeah, I think you're right, Brian. And I also think it's pretty interesting in closing here. Thank both of you for your time um, that we've got parallel storylines running, I think. And that is the fair question. And we'll close with this. The fair question of whether or not there will be uh, small U united conservative parties in place the next time that Albertans vote and the next time that Canadians vote. I, w- I wonder if there might be a split at the provincial and federal levels. Can you see it happening? And I, I can certainly see it happening in Alberta, Sapria. Uh, I don't know about federally. What do you think? I mean, it's already arguably happened to a degree, right? With Max and the People's Party. I guess, um, yeah. I, to, but I, I, yeah, I mean, to your point, I guess it's kind of like a haphazard sort of splitting. Um, if the Conservatives were to do that, it would be like, you know, very it's like shooting themselves in their own genitals here because I don't know how you're ever going to go about winning another election if you do that. So I, I would, for their own sake, hope that they don't do that at the federal level. Does it happen at either level, Brian? Uh, in Alberta, there's a very good scenario where it happens. I think it depends on how the leadership race goes over the next little while. And if people keep arguing, saying you're not a real conservative uh, to various factions, then yeah, I can see it happening because whoever wins will have told the other half of the party, you stink and we don't want you around. And for people that say, well, red Tories don't matter anyway. Peter McKay was described as a red Tory for the entire leadership last time by Aaron O'Toole, who was also a red Tory. And he got 49% of the vote, 49%. So, you know, don't dismiss an entire section of your party because you're going to have to rely on them to win a general election. And if you're not in this to win the general election, you're just joining a debating club so that liberals can keep running the country in per- uh, perpetuity. Two of you played so nice today. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not even disappointed. Brian Lilly, Sapria Devetti, it's great to see both of you. Thanks for making time for us and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks. You got it. You can read Sapria's work. Uh, of course, the Toronto Star, National Observer, see here on Power and Politics and right here on Real Talk. Brian, you can read his work. In the Toronto Sun, and you can both of them follow on Twitter at Brian Lilly and at Supriya Duvetti, respectively. Uh, coming up in just a second, trash talk. I want to remind you right now that Athabasca University is offering you a perfect opportunity to reinvent yourself, to scale up, to get ready for your next career opportunity. It's Canada's online university, and the reason why they have thousands of Canadians enrolling across the country is that you can determine the own pace of your studies. You're never going to fall behind. You can work ahead if you're wired that way, but if you need to take a step back, it's not a problem at all. You don't have that stress hanging over you because you're designing the pace of your own education at Athabasca University. You can find out more about how it works and kickstart the registration, the admissions process at AthabascaU.ca. Our friends at Eden Landscaping want to remind you that soon, soon we will be seeing daffodils and tulips pop up. Before you know it, the grass will be showing itself again and you will be reminded that you need to bring that outdoor space to life. It's what they do. With more than 20 years of experience on the ground in Edmonton and area, if you want a free quote, you want to get in touch with Mike and his team, get a sense of what timelines look like, the design process, you can find them at landscapeedmonton.ca. And when your family is out and about today and you've got that hunger, we want you to think of the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. They've got at Dairy Queen the brand new signature stack burger collection that includes the bacon two cheese deluxe, the flamethrower stacker, the loaded steakhouse burger, the two cheese deluxe and more. You can find their full menu at the Dairy Queens of Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road. And don't forget about their monthly feature blizzards, too. You let them know that Real Talk sent you when you show up to the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Well, every Friday as we wrap up our week, our friends at Local Environmental Services give us an opportunity to blow off a little bit of steam. I mean, uh, waste and recycling management is what they do which means that this feature, of course, a perfect fit. These are all real emails that we've received this week to talk at ryanjesperson.com, a little something we call the Trash Talk. All right, this one from Cheryl yesterday who says, Jesperson, I loved uh, your show. I am a lefty, and I am totally offended by your use of this term in what can only be described as a derogatory manner. Yesterday, that's Wednesday, she says, I had to listen to Brian Jean's sale pitch, and now this? Way to be inclusive, Ryan. Not! That from Cheryl. Point taken. 
Blake says, Ryan, the show may be called Real Talk, but the first definition of talk in my dictionary is to express or exchange ideas by means of spoken words. Speak these words. Sarah, I'm sorry I steamrolled you, says Blake. Then close your mouth and open your ears. You might get some ideas exchanged by means of spoken words that day. Blake, I hope you caught the first 20 minutes of today's show. Appreciate you holding my feet to the fire. What about this one from Marla, who says, I have to respond because the left infighting on Twitter is at a fever pitch. I myself am a left-leaning white woman in Alberta. I have Twitter, although my therapist has advised me to delete it for my mental health. I've had a run-in with certain left-wingers on Twitter. In fact, I have most of them muted or blocked, but the left eating itself is wild to watch. I'm at the point where I'm scared to tweet anything because I'm so worried about being piled on. Why are we infighting so much? We have a common enemy, says Marla. Are we allowed as people who are unlearning to make mistakes and grow and change? I feel like the only acceptable option for many on the Twitter left is perfection. Marla says, I had to do a massive amount of unlearning from my white evangelical Christian upbringing. I don't always get it right. I have to think things out. I even delete some of my tweets. I wish we'd spend less time policing each other and dogpiling each other. People that are trying their best. Maybe they're not so far down that unlearning path as you think. If we approach people with kindness and compassion, people may not become instantly reactive. So let's move forward with compassion and kindness. Let's be open to listening and learning. Let's work toward reconciliation and inclusion together. That from Marla. What about this one from Dr. Martin, who says, The cuts announced to our health professionals is a sick joke. These folks doing their amazing work allow me to do my job as a rural doctor, especially in acute care and ERs. Think of them as vital organs that allow doctors and nurses to work. This is BS. Pharmacy techs, an 11% cut. Social workers, an 11% cut. Speech language pathologists, a 9% cut respiratory therapists literally the people that kept others breathing through our not yet finished pandemic the government's choice of gratitude an eight percent cut and a big screw you physical conditions mental health gaps and social determinants of health poverty homelessness are all issues that albertans face if they're not properly addressed they all end up in the same place the emergency room The doc says these cuts have a goal of saving money. The problem is they'll lead to higher costs when we put more strain on our ERs. That from Dr. Martin. What about this one from Cameron, who says your guest, Dr. Andy Knight from Yale, validated my feelings about humanity. This war against Ukraine has really impacted me. Makes me feel fortunate to feel you know, we're grateful for where I live. We don't have a fear of war coming here. We can protest without being arrested. But what has me so concerned is about this new world order that Dr. Knight said is coming. How world leaders are just full of shit and hypocrisy. World War II, the world saw what appeasing a narcissist does. The world has appeased Putin for two decades. And the reporting from Ukraine has taught me that Putin has pulled the same tactic in Chechnya, Syria, and now Ukraine. And the world just now seems to care. How disappointing, says Cameron. I wouldn't be surprised if similar things happened in Afghanistan and Iraq. But the Western world has an opportunity and an obligation to finally do what's right, to show the world we actually give a shit beyond ourselves. That from Cameron. What about this one from Al, who says, Ryan, why do you continue to insist on truckers defaming the war memorial in Ottawa? Truckers unmasking the Confederate flag. You know, what about the Nazi flag bearers? Apparently an anti-Nazi questioner. Ryan, do you support LGBTQ advocates putting rainbow flags on the Terry Fox statue, or is that different? He says, you have already felt the cancel culture swipe. You can afford to be a little more objective. I am disheartened by your narrative. I am a disillusioned watcher. That from Al. Appreciate you chiming in, Al. And this one from Tamara, who says, Ryan, thank you so much for having Megan from Calgary on your show regarding those demonstrations in the Beltline. These ongoing hate-filled marches have been held every Saturday for nearly a year. These permitless protests have continued to disrupt the peace and harass residents, including me, of the Beltline. We have a right to live peacefully. It's been vetoed for months, and they're receiving support from Calgary Police. The ongoing enabling and facilitation by the CPS on these permitless protests, literally escorting them and clearing roadways every single weekend, validates the harassment incurred and it costs taxpayers millions in the process. That from Tamara. You can send us your trash talks anytime, seven days a week to talk at ryanjesperson.com. It's presented proudly by Local Waste. Coming up on Monday's show, we're going to host a roundtable on NFTs. How much do you know about them? There's a relatively local story, a very cool one about an investment in art that's actually benefiting the public. 
That'll be our jumping off point. In the meantime, have an amazing weekend, friends. Thanks for showing up for The Real Talk, and we'll see you soon.